nation. This nation has been totally changed by the feminist movement. And it was designed to be that way by the devil, obviously, and by others who push this movement. And the first message that I did on feminism, what I did was I took, and we just did the menace of feminism, kind of introduction to it a little bit. Well, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it. All right, this is where it's going. This this is the part that reveals the feminist movement for exactly what it was designed to do. This is called this message when it's titled, Brother Andrew, will be called the evil fruit of feminism, and we're going to deal with many of the fruits of feminism because the fruit of feminism is absolutely evil. Every major social disorder, every major problem today in this nation can be traced back to the roots of feminism and its teaching. Every one of them, without a doubt. Um, and evolution, obviously, but that's evolution is, a mo is part of the feminist movement. It is part of it. Now, Remember the one thing I asked you to do last week? I said, and I want you to think about this. I want you to ask yourself a question. How have I been influenced by the feminist movement, or have I been influenced by the feminist movement? You ask yourself that question, and ask it in the beginning, and then at the end of this lesson, ask yourself the same question. How have I been influenced, or have I? Or can I see how this nation... You know, this is where the rubber meets the road, Christianity. Because I'll tell you what, we, we're not even really going to get to how feminism in the church is. That's going to be like... I think it's less than three, maybe. I don't know, but that's going to be interesting. Uh, how feminism filled the churches today. And how we... The, the design of most churches today has nothing to do with the, with the scriptures. It has everything to do with an infused feministic point of view. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to get right into this. I'm going to, I, I may do a slight little rant for you in the beginning because there's something that bothers me about, and, and it has to do with feminism, so it's, it's right on track. Uh, but open your Bibles to Genesis chapter, actually let me see here where I wrote my, my notes down at. Okay. Yep, let's turn to Genesis we can turn to Genesis chapter 3 first, then we'll go over to Genesis chapter 9, okay? And we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into it here. Um, all right, <clears throat> let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray you be with us now. Help us, Lord, as we look through this, take a sober look at this. And Lord, it may not be easy for some to hear these things, but Lord, it doesn't have to be easy for it to be right. Help us, Lord, to understand this movement for what it really is and how Satan infused this movement and used it in our society, pushed it, made it popular, and infiltrated and infected with disease every aspect of of American life and in the, even in the churches, Lord, and Christian lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Genesis chapter 3, uh, we see here that God, in the beginning God made them what? He made them male and female. You do realize that you can't change that no matter how you try. God made them male and female for a reason. Now, if you don't like the fact that God made you a lady, get over it. If you don't like the fact that God made you a man, get over it. That's what you are, all right? That's the place God puts you. Now, along with that, along with that placement means that you follow God's order. You know, motive is not everything. I'm going to preach another message. I've got a ton of outlines uh, on these things as I've been going through the Scriptures and outlining everything in my Bible here for, through my devotions, but you know, and one of those is, the, is, is order, is, is understanding God's order. And uh, is that, yeah, thanks. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, now I'll sweat a lot, thanks. No, I know, it's just blowing everything everywhere. Um, I'll be fine. I'm used to being a cooker. Uh, anyway, uh, but, um, amen, it's true. Yeah, always in the hot seat. Um, in more ways than one. But God made them male and female. That's God's order. That's the way he made it. Now, you, a woman is not a female man. 
She's different. God made her to be different. Okay? So a lot of times men have a problem understanding that as well, that God made women different. I, I don't want to feel like I'm looking over here at Brother Scott too much here, so I'll move this over a little bit and, uh, and kind of adjust this here and put this in front of me here. Sorry, this is a new setup for me here, so I'm getting used to this, but I'll get used to it. Amen. Um, yeah, yeah, Brother Scott will get over it if I spit his distance too much. He'll, he'll get over it. I'll try to spit over there, Adam, but Sarah, you better duck. Um, anyway, um, but God made them male and female in the beginning. And there was a judgment that God brought down because of sin, okay? Sin brought judgment. Sin brought death, all right? Now, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, that's God's plan. All right, God, uh, Adam already ruled over Eve. It's just that she would be ruled over by a sinner. And she would conceive and bear sinners. And they would break her heart. Amen? That was what the judgment was. It wasn't the fact that children were a judgment. No, children are a blessing, the Bible says. The judgment would be that her husband would be a sinner and she would have to submit to him and he would be wrong sometimes. Right? Just a few times, right? Not very often, right, Brother Garrett? Well, it's, it's in a great while. You might be wrong. Yeah. And that Eve would have to submit to that. And that in the sweat of his brow, he would serve his family. And he would bring forth for the family there. Okay, but that was God's judgment. Now, I want to show over to Genesis chapter 9 here. Uh, God says right away here, this is, this is some of the evil fruit of feminism is to rebel against these things. And that's so why I'm starting with these scriptures because then I'm going to get into reading a lot. There's a lot to read today, so just bear with me, all right? But you need to hear it. You need to have a good foundation, a good understanding of what took place in America, what happened with this movement, and what the fruit of it is, and why. You know, because what we do is we look and we say, well, how did all this happen? How do we wake up one day and, like, women don't know their proper role, men definitely don't know their proper roles. I, I'm telling you what, I talk to so many young men out there, and they are out there chasing ghosts and fighting ghosts and everything else, and they are not doing their – they're not – fulfilling their responsibilities as men and doing the things that they need to do. Like step one, they're not even there yet. They don't even understand what their responsibility before God is. You know? Honestly, my wife should never wonder where money is coming from or if she's going to have it or, or, or to provide for it or whatever. No, that doesn't mean we don't have struggles and financial hard times. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is that she has to do it. She should never think that she's the one that has to do that. Why? Because you won't find that in the Bible anywhere. I challenge anyone to look in the Bible and see where it says that a woman. And if you go to Proverbs 30, please don't start blushing because I'm going to embarrass you. Because that's her husband's estate, and she took care of her husband's estate. She did not take care of somebody else's. She did not work for somebody else that was under the guise of her husband's estate. That doesn't change. That changes nothing. She worked her husband's estate, right? right? She was under him, his authority. That's not very comfortable, is it, to talk about authority? I know in the day and age of Antichrist, we don't like to talk about authority. We don't like to talk about headship. We don't talk, like to talk, but, the, but may I remind you what that book says in Genesis chapter 3, and nothing has changed all the way through? And he shall rule over the and just in case you husbands think that that's a, a a a good indicate you know that you feel pretty good about that how are you ruling are you ruling well are you ruling well and are you ruling at all or is there anarchy in your relationship and in your family because you are not ruling well 
You know, you can cause a child and a woman and anybody else to rebel if you do not rule well. Solomon did it, or Solomon's son Rehoboam did it, didn't he? How about that? Rehoboam had the whole kingdom in his hand, but what did he do? He was a tyrant and a bully, and it was stripped away from him. See the difference? That's not ruling well. So the Bible says pastors are to rule well, right? Amen? Anyway, so that was free. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, I'm going to show you how feminism teaches the exact opposite of that and hates that. And, you know, some of these things are amazing because, really, what happens is you wouldn't think this was going on back in the 1860 to the 1920s, and it was absolutely going on. I mean, it was wicked. There was a social revolution that was taking place. It was absolutely changing the dynamic of the family completely. It was an attack. Feminism is an attack on the family. A very successful attack. It was, I, I guess you could say, the first message we covered was feminism's attack on the country. The second one here is really feminism's attack on the family. And then we'll talk about another one will be feminism's attack on the church. Boy, did it ever change things. All right. So, you know, what is the fruit of feminism? Well, in short, I'll give you all of them, then we're going to talk about them. Number one, immodesty. Feminism pushed immodesty and this unisex culture where you can no longer tell the difference between a man and a woman because that's what they wanted and I'll, I'll read it to you that's what their goal was they wanted that they didn't want you to be able to tell the difference because they didn't want a difference the feminist movement can be summed up in one word Rebellion. Rebellion. That's what it is. It is rebellion. It is the heart of the issue. Rebellion. Next, after, after immodesty, abortion. Abortion is the fruit of feminism. Absolutely. After abortion, eugenics. Eugenics. You know what eugenics is? Eugenics is survival of the fittest. What that means, Giannis, is that if I didn't want, if I thought there was a flaw in your children, we would have them put to death. We would weed that that disgusting, we would weed them out as weeds, right? That's what, that's what Margaret Sanger called. Oh, we're going to talk about that wicked witch, Margaret Sanger. That devilish, nasty woman. You can go listen to the sermon I did on Margaret Sanger, too. I did a complete study of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. She's a wicked witch. Was. She's burning in hell now. But, uh, but she leaves behind. And she's still gathering up that uh, fruit for her destruction, too, as well. Anyway, eugenics, the transgender movement... Sexual promiscuity or fornication as a fruit of the feminist movement. When you take all modesty out of a woman, guess what happens? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going we're to start reading some of these. The first thing we're going to talk about is immodesty or dress. In social life, the spirit of bol bol Bolshevism is painly manifest. Indeed, we have fallen upon times of social anarchy. Now, understand, this was written like back in like 1900. These guys would absolutely have a heart attack if they saw it now. But they were men that stood up and said the hard thing at the time that it needed to be said, where nobody wanted to say it. And still, nobody wants to say it today. 
This is not, a, you know what most, first of all, most pastors would not talk about this ever in their church, number one. If they did, it would be on a small, watered-down scale on a Sunday night when they know that the bulk of their givers don't show up anyway. And they would water it down so as not to offend all of the ladies and the feminist men that are in the crowd. Amen. That's just the truth. I've been through fundamentalism. We're going to do a message on that, the feminism and fundamentalism. Oh, that's going to be fun. Anyway. Yep. Amen. That's right. Old landmark. But, but what he said was social anarchy was coming. He was right. That was the whole goal. Social anarchy. That's the whole goal of feminism. Old landmarks are being swept away and our entire social system is threatened with destruction. A discerning writer well says this. It is high time someone got up the nerve enough to speak out against these forms of evil, especially the immodest dress evil. No doubt many girls and women also are profoundly innocent and ignorant of the crime they are committing by wearing the low neck, short sleeved, transparent peekaboo affairs they are pleased to call waste, but others are not so ignorant. What he's saying is they basically were uncovered and wearing things that completely showed off everything on their body. He said the innocent should be kindly and fully informed and gently and stir the guilty sternly rebuked. Truly such a thing is void of beauty, void of common sense, void of modesty, void of decency, and for the most part, void of the very becoming quality of covering up nakedness. That's what it did. How modest young women and girls can put on and wear on the, one of those rigs is more than we can understand. Surely they must be ignorant of the fact or careless of it that such fashions originate among harlots and actresses and leaders in fast society, with sole businesses is to attract themselves to the gaze of men, and so dress to make themselves conspicuous for the exp express purpose. Basically what he's saying is, is that most of the clothes that are wore back then that the people were starting to wear on the streets were what whores wore. And I can say today, most of the clothes that women wear on the streets today would make a whore blush back then. People think that's not kind to say things like that, but I'll advise you to go to the scriptures and type in the word whore and see how many times it's written in there. And the Bible talks about the attire of a harlot in Proverbs 7. That means that there is an attire that represents... A harlot. I didn't write it. I'm only preaching it. Amen? Somebody's got to, right? Somebody's got to talk about it. And yet with all girls and women who would blush at the very thought of being reckoned among such a class, array themselves in the same attire with no better excuse than that it is fashionable. Now, we talked about this in our modesty series, so I'm not going to stay on this a lot because I did like a, what was it, a two and a half hour teaching or something that day on modesty. So it's there. We're going to put that online, Brother Andrew. I don't know where Brother Andrew is. He's somewhere. There he is. We're going to put that online, Brother Andrew, sometime. I'm going to have you edit some things, then I'm going to have you put that online. Because I think that modesty, that should be online. It should, not enough people talk about it. Not enough pastors really want to talk about it. It's not very uh, popular. Right? Not very popular. But it needs to be talked about. Amen. It seems to me that if they sense what they are doing, they would quickly forever cease. If girls had a faint idea of the disgusting sight they presented or could hear some of the unmanly and vulgar remarks made about them as they pass along the streets clad in one of the above described waist or in one of those short outlandish skirts, he's talking about mini skirts, they would feel so ashamed that if they had a spark of virtue in them, they would go to their rooms or get out of sight somewhere till they had a sensible dress to put on. How can they expect people to distinguish them from the low and corrupt if they dress exactly like them? You know, this, this caused quite a stir when this book came out. That's why it's only been printed twice. Some try to make excuse for wearing thin material, perforated waist, and the like because of the heat in the summertime, but this excuse is too flimsy for anything, for I have seen them on the street with their chest exposed to the bitter wind when it is 10 below zero. And I can honestly say I have too. Right? 
when we go out and street street preach, right? We're out there and they are absolutely uncovered. Mhm. Yep. And don't care. And they're freezing and I've got like three layers on and like a big under armor windproof, waterproof, breathe proof abominable snowman outfit on trying to keep myself warm and these girls are running around with like nothing on i'm like how are you doing this standing in line right standing in line and i'm like you gotta be kidding me this isn't even possible how are you doing this and i'm freezing right and these are little skinny little girls anyway No wonder so many die of consumption of the diseases caused by exposing the body to the cold. That's true. Remember that one girl over here that we preached to in Northfield here? They found her outside and she froze to death. She got drunk and froze to death. We warned her. I talked to her for hours out there. They mocked the preaching. They blasted heavy metal music. All those things. Wouldn't listen. She died six months later. The immodest dress evil is a shame, a disgrace, and an outrage against the conscience of every upright and pure-minded young man, making well-nigh impossible for him to keep his thoughts clean and barred from the suggestions of the devil. See, that's the truth of the matter that nobody wants to admit. Ladies like to say, well, every man, and I agree with what the scriptures say, that every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I, I agree. But you don't have to be the object of it. You don't have to dress in a way to instigate that. Right? Amen. He says here, during this last year, the limit of vulgarity in female dress has been reached. No, it hasn't. The effect is so gross that no pen can describe it, and its details are offense. There is no beauty in it, no gracefulness about it. It is nothing but vileness unredeemed. And the great pity of it is that most of the wearers of these degradingly suggestive attire are innocent girls who have not the faintest idea of what they're doing. And I believe that. There are many girls out there, they don't have a clue what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what men really think about them. And how some do, but many of them don't. I mean, you got babies out there, what I would call babies. And I'm sorry, I'm 40, I'm almost 41. So when I see little 16-year-old girls, to me, they are like babies. I'm, they just are. I don't look at them like, like an adult. I look at them like a kid. And I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you know, these are babies out there, and they have no idea what they're doing. Where is your father at so I can smack him upside his head? I mean, honestly, your father lets you leave the house like that. Doesn't even care. It's a shame is what it is. It's a downright shame. Dads have a responsibility, and so do moms. But you have a responsibility to your children. Especially when they're under your roof and in your home. You don't let them dress like that. He says here, had the young, I'm going to skip some of these things, but had the young lady of 25 years ago walked down the street clad as many as them are today, she would have promptly been arrested for indecent exposure of person. I wonder that all the time when I see these women flash us and everything, we're on the streets and all that stuff happens. I just wonder, like, how in the world don't they get in trouble for that? How is that okay? And now you have beaches out there that have, and whole towns that are like, you know, that are making nude beaches and stuff a reality. Like you can just walk around like that wherever you want to, and there's not going to be any, any punishment for that. I'm going to tell you why. Two major end time sins, sorcery and fornication. Those two usher in the devil's kingdom. Sorcery and fornication. What is sorcery? Pharmaceutica, medicine, drugs. Mm -hmm. Drugs. Like just like the recent shooting, right? All those other things. What what do they all have in common? Most of them have psychotropics, uppers and downers, medicine, suicide pills. That's what they have in common. Anyway, she, he, he goes on to talk about uh, one of the feminists said this, a, a recent remark to the writer. I have just as much right to show my limbs as a man has to show his. 
Ten years ago, this same lady would have been far from such a speech. Obviously, she had been inoculated with the germ of feminism. For a lady to even think that, that that's an issue, well, I if, if he can wear that, then I can wear that. Yeah, he's not supposed to either, but the point is, why would you want to be like a man? Why is it somehow degrading? I want to ask you something, lady, in your mind and your heart right now, and I want you don't answer me. Answer God. But let me ask you a question. Do you feel as if there's a necessity and a need for you to be equal with a man? To be identical with a man? If, the th- if that thought comes into your heart, you already are rebellious. You already have a rebellious heart. I want you to think about that. I plan on making lots of friends today. But I want you to ask yourself that question. Do I think I need to be equal with a man? No, you need to be what God created you to be. <gasps> oh, so not my will, but thy will be done. See, that's the true heart of the matter. That's really the true heart. The heart. That's what God wants. You have no idea what bill of goods you've been sold by the devil. You have no idea what he has done to try to infuse into your mind to make you think that you're in competition with a man. That's that's the devil's work. Why? Well, because if you're in competition with a man, then you won't be fulfilling the role that God has for you. Right? Right? If you don't fulfill the role that God has for you, then you're not glorifying God with your life. You've been distracted. You've been sold the lie that Eve was sold in the garden. Ye shall be as gods. The bathing suits worn by women bathing with men are too indecent to describe without appearing vulgar. Boy, if they were back then, my goodness, what are they now? Right? In one of the daily papers of Louisville, there recently appeared a picture of a man dancing with a woman both in their bathing suits. The whole edition of the paper should have been suppressed by the law forbidding obscene literature from the males. It was worse than the second-class matter. To say, it at the, to say the least, from the spectator's standpoint, these leave nothing to be desired. The propriety of such suits is perhaps a question of aquatic causatry. At first blush, not the bathers, it would seem that the proprieties of dress should be maintained on ocean or on the shore. Yeah, what is it all of a sudden about water that you need to be naked? I don't know if you know this, but did you know that you could swim in like you know, like shorts and a t-shirt or, or whatever, p- even pants and a shirt. You you know, you, you can do that, right? You know that, men? You don't have to, like, take your shirt off and, like, I don't know if you – you're not going to drown if you have clothes on. I don't know if anybody's I, – I, I don't want to – let me break it, in, break it to you easy, okay? You're not going to drown. Lady, you can stay clothed and you can get in the water and it's you're not going to drown, I promise. Right? That's right. Amen. You're not going to drown. You can be modest. You could still be modest, right? Amen. Wait, that's good right there. Okay, anyway, he talks about dancing and a few of those other things there, which we already know that we're against. Thousands of girls dress in a manner that they would discard with horror and disgust if they knew the trains of thoughts which are suggested by their presence. I know young men, and I know that there is not one in 100 who attends a full dress party, he says, and comes out as pure and worthy of a man as he went in. There is not one in 100 who does not hold the secret of a base thought suggested by the style of dress which he sees around him. Doubtless it does, but we are obliged to take things as we find them. The millennium has not yet dawned, and we have receded a considerable distance. I tell you a fact, and if you are modest, a modest young woman, you will heed its suggestions. If you choose to become the objects of foul fancies among young men whose respect you are desirous of securing, you know the way. The same thoughtful writer remarks that there are multitudes of women with whom dress is the all-prevalent thought. 
They think of it, dream of it, live for it. It goes with them from the ballroom into the weeds of the house of death. They use it as a means of splitting grief into vulgar fractions and led out of great bereavements in the consolations of vanity by the hands of numerators and denominators. The excuses offered for indecent dress are usually as silly as they are sinful. It's true. One of the current apologies for the dress of the feminists is that such dress is fashionable. We talked about that. I'm, I won't elaborate on that. Go back and listen to that uh, modesty series. Suppose for the sake of the argument, it should become fashionable for a woman to appear upon the street clad only in hair net and a smile. Would fashion justify such a performance? Well, today, yes. Unfortunately, licentiousness has become quite fashionable with many fashionable people, but this is not a justification. Unless the fashion plate shall change, social anarchy seems a certainty. That's what happened here. We did go through social anarchy. Another excuse offered by the feminist for immodest dress is that the constant exposure of the person will become a matter of course and therefore soon cease to excite the opposite sex. They're saying if they run around naked, it won't impact anybody. Well, I'm sorry. There's enough real men out in the world that if women run around naked, it's going to bother them. Right? I'll say it. I'm too much of a man for you not to wear clothes. Hey, is that too real for you? I'll say it again. I'm too much of a man for you not to wear clothes. I don't have a problem saying that. That's how God made me. God made me attracted to sight. If you run around naked, that's going to have an impact on me. Right? Just like every red-blooded, red-blooded man that will tell the truth. If you got a little sugar in your tank, maybe that's not the case. But I don't have any of that in my tank. Mine burns clean. All right? I'm just telling you the truth, friend. I'm going to be real with you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? Why do it? Why pretend like it's some kind of game? And why pretend like you're something that you're not? That's how God made you to be attracted to sight. That's how men were created. That's why he made Eve beautiful <laughs> and Adam to desire her. Right? Makes sense to me anyway. That's just common sense. Only today we have this unisex philosophy where it's like, oh, that's taboo to say something like that. No, it's not. It's being a real man. Amen. Right? It is a lot cleaner what they say. <laughs> Anyway, okay. All right, we're going to move on here. I think I made my point with that. Next, the mas- masculine, masculine, masculine woman, basically. That's the, next, that's the next fruit of feminism, to emasculate, uh, to emasculate women, to make them more like men. That's the goal of feminism, that there be no difference between the two, that they all be alike. There are certain feminine instincts and traits of character that differentiate women from men. These very differences characterize her sex and magnify the worth and winsomeness of womankind. In fact, effeminacy is the natural and distinguishing glory of the woman. That's why when you see men effeminate, it's against nature and it repulses you. Right? When you're a real man and you see an effeminate man, it makes you like sick. You like you get tired of it like it's like stop, you know, you know, straighten your wrist out, lose the limp wrist. Put some man's clothes on, right? Quit talking like that. I'm talking about like everywhere you go. Well, that's not politically correct. I know neither am I. I never said I was. I don't want to be politically correct. Because they're a bunch of effeminate, limp-wristed men that are scared to come out and say the truth. Because women might get, you know, I'm going to tell you something where people are really, you know what the real problem is? Nobody's worried about the men getting mad. What they're worried about is the women getting mad. That's what they're worried about. Everybody's worried about the women getting mad at them. And I, I, I have four daughters. I don't care if women get mad at me. I could care less if you get mad at me. You all know that full well that I don't care if you get mad at me. I'll still sleep at night. If it, if I don't drink too much coffee, but I, I, I will, I'll still sleep. It's not that I don't love you. It's that I love you. The, I, the greatest friend of a woman is a man that'll tell her the truth. You know what that used to be called? Manhood. 
that you weren't scared and you, you, you weren't like scared to come out and say the truth. Well, I have to break this to my wife. No, I don't have to break it delicately. I'm going to tell you the truth. This is the way it is. Well, that's offensive. I know the truth is always offensive. It's kind of what they crucified Christ for. You know, the truth. It's kind of like all the apostles died for, you know, the truth. It's kind of like all my Baptist forefathers died for, you know, the truth. Marvel this. There's a difference in man and women. <gasps> How dare you say that? I know I like saying it. I'll say it again. There's a difference between man and woman. In the beginning, he made them male and female. And that makes some people mad. So a lot of pastors and men are afraid to talk like that. Well, I'm teaching my daughters there is a difference. I'm teaching my oldest daughter, you're not in competition with your brother. God made you who you are, and you're wonderful the way God made you, and you're going to grow into be what God wants you to be. You're not going to try to be what he is. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no competition there. There isn't this vying for position there. You're made different. God made you different for a reason. And you're to glorify God and how God made you. If that offends you, it's because you have a heart that is rebellious. You thought this was going to be really easy and sweet today, didn't you? Just because I was sitting down, I didn't want to fool you, Carly. Carly thought, oh, great, he's not going to yell now because he's sitting down. That's what she said. I said, oh, Carly, I sure will. <laughs> I tricked her. <laughs> gotcha, Carly. Anyway, but uh, here's, a, here's another thing let me say to you, okay? The mas masculinizing, of, uh, masculinizing women, making masculine women. Just turn on the news. Can I ask you a question? Why does there got to be a woman everywhere on the news? Every channel has some foxy little broad on there that's half naked. That the only reason why the guys are watching the program in the first place is because she's showing her chest off. And she's showing her body off. And I'm forced to hear this feministic view of things that is totally pushed about with feelings and everything else. And our last president was like completely enamorated with that effeminate spirit. And he acted the same way where his wife's all manly and like, you know, and, and he's all limp wristed and afraid. Right. And he's I'm serious. Like he's all limp wristed and afraid. And I'm like. Really, seriously, like your wife is like bolder than you are. And when I go out preaching, you know what happens when we go preaching? The wife is always bolder and more masculine than the man. The man's, the woman's like, come on, let's leave. Okay. And the guy's like, okay. And the guy's like dragged off. And she's like, I told you to come. Let's go. And she's like screaming at him. And he's like, okay. Like that lesbian down here in Northfield, she about let, that rocket was about ready to light off, and I was waiting for it. Man, I wanted to. I if that cop wouldn't have came over, that rocket would have been lit, and I would have watched her go, <laughs> boom, straight up there, because I could see her getting like it was rising, and I was like, okay, because I'm about ready to push full manhood on her and watch her go. Oh, I was I was going to push the full man. I was going to give her a full dose of manhood right there. And that lesbian was going to blow because I was like, you know what? You're a butch lesbian, but I'm a real man. I'm going to show you what manhood really is like. Because she thought I was going to go limp wristed like the guy next to her did because she told him to shut up. He's like, OK. And I, and I looked at him. And I said, why did you shut up when she told you to? Are you afraid of her? Are you afraid of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid or what? Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even like the least bit afraid of this Butch. I'm not, I'm not. I want her to know what a real man is. I want her to know she needs to be saved. I wasn't mean to her, and I wasn't speaking unkind to her. I was being very, very calm and very deliberate. And I was, she was the one screaming at me, and I was talking in a low voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Anyway, yeah. So... 
But on the news, you go, you turn there, everything, all of it's women telling you everything they think. Why? Since when is society? Since when should a government be ran by women? Children are their oppressors, and what? Women rule over them. What does the Bible say? Again, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yep. There are certain feminine instincts, right, that a woman has. In fact, if femininity is the natural and distinguishing glory of the woman. In the scheme of life and living, the creator has endowed women with these particular and peculiar characteristics. Anything that tends to destroy these distinctive characteristics is destructive alike to Christianity and civilization. Modesty has been one of the inherent traits that has adorned women throughout all the ages. Her modesty has commanded the respect and reverence of man and has been her charm and protection. When this is gone, she has... She has bid goodbye to her crown and glory. And while we may thank heaven that there are countless thousands of uh, millions of modest, true, and noble women as the world has ever known, the fact remains that within the last two decades there has been a tragic loss of womanly modesty. Womanly modesty. In seeking equal rights with men, they have acquired the boldness of men. Okay, so now we're going to get into some scripture. I want to show you something here. All right. Second, uh, First Timothy chapter two. Verse number nine. Women are not supposed to be bold in that sense. If your wife is more bold than you, that's because you're not being bold enough. Amen. That's the truth, friend. You don't have to be a loud mouth. I'm not talking about that. Not everybody has different tendencies and everything. But you know what? Your wife shouldn't be leading the marriage. You should be. You should be leading. That's what God's called you to do. Amen. Come on, that's Bible, friend. This is like this is like Christianity 101. Like this is basic marriage 101. You know why I have to do marriage counseling in the first place? And I don't believe that's, I believe that's the father's duty. And some of you, as, as your children, right, you know, you can consult with me, that's fine. But you know what, in the end, you're to be the one, you're the one to do that. You're to prepare your children for marriage, not me. I'm their pastor, you're their parents. You should be preparing them for marriage. Amen. I'll feed you and give you what you need from the word of God. You feed your own family the truth with that. And you prepare them. The Bible says in like manner, in verse number nine, in like, it says, well, look at verse number eight. I will therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What does that mean? That the men are bold and they pray, lifting up holy hands, that they're the ones that are bold. They stand up and pray with their hands raised to the air and cry out to God and speak boldly. But it says here, in like manner. So the same way that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, shamefacedness, with sobriety. What does that mean, shamefacedness? What that means? Let's look. All right. I'm going to look. I'm going to get you the definition here. It means bashfulness, an excess of modesty. It means that they can blush. You know what the Bible says about a woman that can't blush? It says they have a whore's forehead. And they can't blush. Amen? This goes back to us men understanding that, you know what? There are certain conversations that you don't have in front of ladies. Why? Because God made them different, that's why. And they're not supposed to hear about things. There are certain things... Oh, I'll give you an example. There is a totally different conversation when we... And 15 of us men are riding in the van going street preaching with no women around. And for the most part, there's nothing wrong with that conversation. All right? When there is, I yell at people. But for the most part, there's nothing wrong with that conversation. Okay? That's men talking. And men are going to talk bold. Men are going to talk straightforward. When we are in mixed company, 
we do not have that same conversation. Because God made women different, and you're to respect God's order. And when you don't, you're being indecent and improper. So I'm going to challenge some of you young men to be very careful with your conversation that you have openly in this room when you're fellowshipping and everything else if there are ladies around. There are things that you just don't talk about. You go to that conversation. That's not wrong. And your wife doesn't need to know everything. Amen. There's things your wife doesn't even know that she can't handle anyway in the first place. I've learned that the hard way. As a pastor, I've learned that the hard way. All right, anyway. I'm not talking about hiding your sin from your wife. I'm speaking of other things. You know what I'm talking about. Use wisdom. Okay, modesty has been one of the inherent traits that has adorned women throughout all the ages. And while we may well thank heaven that there are those women, there's been a tragic loss of modesty. In desiring equality with men, they acquired the masculine demeanor. I'm telling you, they're just like it. I mean, it's like like you get in a room at a factory or anywhere else with a bunch of women there, or, or women mixed with men, they talk just like the men. There's no difference. Hey, you want to know why there's sensitivity training in corporations? You want to know why? Because women aren't home making babies. Yeah. <gasps> he said it. How could he say that? Because God said it. <laughs> He said that they would be keepers at home, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know why I have to worry about talking around a woman at, at work if I work in a factory or work somewhere else like that? You know why I have to worry about that? Because she's not supposed to be there. You know why you a infuse a whole different dynamic into the, into the thing and you have to even, you can't be a man anymore? And if you're a man... Seriously, they want to pass a law in some of these places that a man can't even sit like a man anymore. Do you understand that? They call it man spreading, where there, where a man's not allowed to sit like a man sit like this, you know. I'm not kidding you. I'm being dead serious. This is the fe the effemini the feminization of the culture. They want to root out any bit of manhood, and I absolutely 100% resist it and can't. And I love the fact that they hate it when I do. And I'm glad this is going online. And I want to boost it on Facebook. And I want to boost it on Sermon Audio. And I want every Everybody, and YouTube, and I want everybody to hear it because I'm tired of seeing a, a feministic society everywhere where it's wrong to be a man. They don't want you to be a man anymore. They want to destroy the sexes. I got something to shout about, amen. At last, we have fallen on times when modesty is being discussed more by men than by women. You know, women used to be like, I can't believe she's wearing that. She shouldn't wear that. Now it's like, hey, I like that. I think I'll get one. Right? I think I'll dress my daughter like that whore Miley Cyrus. I think I'll let him listen to her records and play her mu or not records <laughs> anymore. MP3, sorry. Uh, play her MP3s and, and, uh, and listen to those. Her music. I think I'll let her download it on her on her iPod. Here's a news flash. Is it do you even know what's on your children's iPod? If they have one, mine don't have one. They get supervision if they get anything. I know I'm mean. And you ain't getting a cell phone either. I need no cell phone. You sure ain't getting no smartphone. You sure ain't getting one of those. You little runt, you don't need one. I've seen the generation raised on iPhones. Whew. Scary stuff. All right. The real women and the feminists are described in the following lines. 100 years ago today, the wilderness was here. The man with powder in his gun went out to hunt the deer. But now the thing has changed somewhat, and on another plan, the deer with powder on her face goes out to hunt the man. They spell it D-E-A-R. 
It's true. With her dear doggy, powdered face, painted cheeks, and penciled browns, the feminist goes forth to conquer, and it is to be feared sometimes, stoops to conquer. The female man and the male woman is the abomination of desolation, not spoken of by Daniel the prophet, but probably would have been had these physical hybrids existed in his days and generations. From the mannish woman and the womanish man, good Lord, deliver us. Should the current craze continue... Listen to this. Now you listen to this closely. This is prophetic. The person will have to use three genders for the human race. He, she, and it. This was written back in 1917, I believe. The following thoughtful editorial, though written several years since, precisely and graphically describes the present situation. Since this agitation became general, women have been distinctly going downhill in the all-womanly qualities. As the woman gains in what the he-woman calls opportunity, she loses in character. These he-women are themselves essentially masculine. They are like the male politicians, blatant and self-seeking. In the home life, those of them who had any home life have been failures. They are no more fit to lead decent and true women than if they were morally bankrupt for their influence is wholly immoral. It is not alone the idle rich who are a law unto themselves who go abroad and buy titles by a process of shameless prostitution, who in their conduct and attire emulate the prosperous of the European capitals, whose life is godless, graceless, and sensual. They are merely occasional eyesores. The he-woman whose cry for sexual freedom rings out to bandwagons and echoes up and down the lines of circus parades, elated by the enthusiasm of poor drabs that follow. The silly sallies and crazy Janes on the rank and file do not or will not perceive that the multiplying tragedies and scandals of the day are the direct offspring of their teaching. That sex freedom too weak or vicious minds means license. That adultery seems no worse in women than in men. That opportunity and equality are expressed by the lewd dances, furnish the women the means hitherto conceded to the man of initiating sensual indulgence. The bad manners of the young women of the better class are everywhere conspicuous. They are being educated to the knowledge of evil. Sex barriers are thrown down. The forbidden has become the rule. The laws of God and nature are reversed. To meet the requirements of the he-woman, the he-women who seek to rule the roost, self-assertion must take the place of self-denial. Riding a single horse, the woman must insist upon riding before. And as every woman, woman has the right to choose the father of her own children, in case she is fool enough to have any, in case one father does not answer, she may get another. There being neither limitation nor responsibility to the dogma of free love. Heavens. Rome had it. So did Athens. When the feminine New Jerusalem arrives, which of these he-women will play Aspesia? But much of this is Latin, and all of it is Greek, to the shock-headed shock boys who have come to the editorial font front of affairs from baseball field through the city editor's room, and who, where they do not welcome the arrival of Cleopatra and the rule of Catherine, are unable to consider any ethical question beyond its direct relation to the news of the day. He's saying men can't think. They just don't think about it. They don't discern anything anymore. They don't think. They don't want to discern anything. The men are hopeless. Too many of them are only too willing to have woman degrade herself. They will because it works out for them. Too many of them see nothing beyond the short range of their naked vision. The fathers in Israel, sure in wisdom and firm to duty, are conspicuous by their absence. It is the mothers of Israel who must come to the rescue. Chivalry may not be dead, but it seems on the wane, and the he woman women are doing what they can to kill it. For all its boasted progress and achievement, its wondrous inventions, its diffused intelligence, its vast en engineeries, and accreditation of what it calls enlightenment, the world does not increase in moral power and moral strength. There are more cranks and crankisms than ever before. India was never fuller. Hell breaks loose in unlooked-for places and easier and often even in the heart of civilization, offering spurious remedies for fancied ill, sure cures for irremedial conditions. 
The Furies stand upon the battlements, lashing the credulous to frenzy. The wanton girls of the he girl schools would abolish the home. That's what the goal was. They wanted to abolish the home. The wanton women, the wanton woman in the bandwagons would abolish religion. As in France, during the terror, they have constructed a supreme being of their own and seated this in a chariot to whose wheels they bind the weakest along with the worst of men, including not a few who call themselves ministers of the gospel of Christ. Yet there stands the home, the Bible, the wife, the mother before their eyes, emblazoned on the walls, the laws of God and nature, and except that womanhood breathes into them the life of action inspired by the light from heaven, we are lost. He's saying if there's not some real women that stand up, for what they believe and follow the Bible, the culture is lost. And at this point, we see the destruction of our culture because there aren't those women that are standing up. Are there not enough of them, I should say? It's sad. It really is. With the lowered ideas of modesty, decency, and morality, there is no improvement in sight. With our women dressing so as to offend every sense of cleanness, and our courts reeking with the vileness of salacious infidelity, with lawyers and courts laughing at the sacredness of the marriage relation and fattening of the, off the spoils of corruption, and a public that simply tolerates in silence the outrages on society, where are we headed? This was back in 1970. This is 100 years ago. Strangely enough, the feminists, in claiming all the privileges of man, have overlooked one of the obligations of manhood. That's the duty. You know, he talks about the duty of war, but now they want to do that too. Some of them. He goes on to say this, which I think is interesting. He says, it is becoming quite common in some sections to have women serve on juries. It wasn't 100 years ago. Have we evolved? Have we evolved? Are we better now? Right? Think about that. Should my wife ever be picked for jury duty to come out of my home and take care of my children to go serve on a jury somewhere? In the Bible, who made those decisions? Brother Finney? You know as a lawyer. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, they are. Women are moved by their emotions. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Right. That know how to discern. Right. Exactly. So, I, in fact, you and I have had this discussion before, Brother Finney, about that. We, him, Brother Finney and I have discussed that about courts and about how, you know, when you're choosing a jury and everything like that. According to the laws of the several states, jurymen must ki be kept together until discharged. Not infrequently, a jury must be kept together for one or more nights. This would, with the mixed jury, seem to present an awkward, if not embarrassing, situation, though the advanced feminists may be able to present some solution to the problem. So he's saying that it's improper. It is improper. First of all, what, what does the Bible say about Eve? What was she? Who remembers what Eve was? She was deceived in what? The transgression. Eve being deceived was in the transgression. Yes. Yes, sir. Yep. Right. I know. Right. No, exactly. The judges have been taken over by women. You see them in the courts. They're everywhere. Uh, the, and what do you have? You have a fe an effeminate society now. You have an effeminate rulings now. You have feelings appealed to instead of the law. It's what I feel. And listen, I like the fact that you feel. And there is a proper place for that feeling. But guess what? That proper place is not in matters of judgment. Only in the jurisdiction that God has given you, in the home. That's where the discernment is in raising your children. That's where the, in taking care of a husband. 
in guiding the home like that's where that those feelings and that love and that compassion, all those things come into play. But when you make hardcore judgments, the Bible says, and thou shalt not pity them. When you go to judge a matter that you don't pity them. Well, what do women do? They have a tendency to pity and you can appeal to their emotions. Right? That's not bad. I'm not upset because you have them. I'm glad you have them. I'm saying that God never puts you in a position like that. Go back and listen to if you use Deborah as an excuse. And uh, what about Deborah and other silly excuses women use to usurp authority over men? Yes, that was actually a title. It's true because I, there's an explanation for it in the Bible. Now, if that makes you mad, you might have some feminists in you. I'm just saying. And I hope to be able to root that out and for you to repent of that. And if you're a man and that makes you mad, then you definitely have some feminists in you. And I really hope to root that out. Amen? I Listen, it goes without saying, but I said this before, I could not do what I do without my wife. Okay, I understand that fully, and she knows that. But my wife's place is not to stand in judgment of this ministry. My wife's place is not to stand in judgment calls. That's not her place. Her place is to care for me and the children and for me to love her and for me to provide for her and for her to care for the children, for her to be a keeper at home, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's her duty before God. Is that a slight? Is there something demeaning about that? Do you think it's demeaning? If you do, you have some feminism to repent of. You've been inoculated with it. Amen. Somebody vaccinated you with feminism. They poisoned you. Okay. It isn't that we are naturally obs. Okay, here's the editor of the Houston, Texas Post said this. It isn't that we are naturally obstinate and mean. Just somebody give us proof that the mothers and homemakers are pleading for the ballot. The majority of the fair pleaders that we now are so entirely unmotherly and unhomemaking, it wouldn't surprise us in particular to go to the washroom of a Pullman some morning to find a batch of them warming up safety razors preparatory to shaving themselves. <laughs> yeah. These men were bold. I mean, they, they hated feminism, and they knew what it was going to do. Dr. Emil Reich, in his London lecture, says this. I do not blame. Now, listen to this. I do not blame. I do not praise. I only say that the American woman is not womanly. She is not a woman. The whole of the United States is under petticoat government, and man is practically non-existent. In America, woman commands man. Man, man does not count there. The last man that came was Christopher Columbus. Now, I don't agree with that, but the point of the premise is what he's saying is as he looks at a hole, that's what he sees. Amen, that's what he sees. And he's, he's, he was telling the truth because that's what was happening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you that might shock you. Not you. Probably not you. Well, maybe some of you. But not all of you. I do not believe women should vote. I absolutely do not believe they should vote. I don't believe it's the place for a woman to vote. Absolutely not. I believe that it is not necessary. Women voting brought Bill Clinton. Women voting romanticized the ballot. It no longer is hardcore facts that determine that. Is that too old-fashioned? Because did you know that women weren't allowed to vote over 100 years ago in America? I didn't make that up. What's changed? Feminism. I'm sorry, that's what changed. And we've been so accustomed to it that we just think it's, it's okay. No, it's not okay. 
I don't think women should vote in church either. Here's another one that'll upset somebody, I guess, maybe. I don't know. You upset, Adam? Adam's not upset. I'm not asking Sarah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sarah's heard this before, so... <laughs> This is this is the feminist series reloaded though. It's way more fiery, I think. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. Kind of... This subject gets me fired up though. <laughs> this may with truth be applied to the feminist. Okay. Anyway, one of the most prominent and brilliant northern pastors writes the author as follows. I have loved the Western Recorder since I read the first copy I ever saw in 1897. Your article on December 28th 1922 is in line with its historic loyalty to truth. It so stirs me that I want a few moments of your crowded time to tell you how greatly I appreciate all you have so well said. Here's what he says. I esteem womanhood above all that is called man, but she must be woman in ideal and in practice. It is a matter of note, both in scripture and in secular history, that when women have come to the front to take up the sphere of men, world conditions have been at a low ebb, and morals, both public and private, have about reached the bottom. Look at things now among all the forces now operating toward the downward tendency of the times. No one, nor no half dozen, are having the demoralizing effect as the bold appearance of the masculine woman, women in man's sphere, and many of them actually in men's britches. My nature almost instinctively rebels at the impulse. Mine does too, by the way. I first feel to take off my hat to one of these masculine female monstrosities, now parading the world in the guise and garb of men. However misguided in their zeal, they are proving a curse to the cause of Christ and common morality of young manhood and young womanhood as well. Can I give you an example of that? I'll give you examples of women in leadership in the Bible and what happened. Deborah, the guy was too scared to go to war without the woman. And it was a shame unto Israel. And what is the book of Judges? And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Right? That's the theme, yeah, that's right. Here's another one. Jezebel. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. If there would be a picture of a feminist, it would have to be Jezebel. Or maybe Baphomet. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, and Athelia, remember her? She killed all the seed royal, and they hid little King Josiah. They hid him away because that old wicked witch went in there and killed everybody, killed all the family, and she ruled and reigned on the throne. And may I remind you again the Bible, what it says? Children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. It's a curse. That's what the Bible says. Amen. He goes on to say, When men put on corsets, part their hair in the middle, begin singing feminine sopranos, stay at home, cook the meals, rock the cradle while the wife-husband does the work of the man, then I think it time for a general sterilization of all the race that such progency be stopped and the judgment come at once. Oh, we're already there. Men are wearing those. Right. I don't know. I didn't watch it. What are you looking at? <laughs> okay. What? How long have we been going here? Did somebody have a... Oh, man. This one's... It feels like days. Is that what somebody said? <laughs> this is like all one. Yeah. You know what? I think I'll I'll continue in the afternoon maybe. What time is it? We've been going about an hour and 10. Okay. Let's stop right now, and then we'll pick it up this afternoon. Okay? Because uh, I was going to preach something else, but I think I'll continue with this. I want this all in one file, and I want it to go out in one thing, and it will make everybody happy. Um, anyway. Because we got a lot more to cover. I didn't realize this was so long, but I knew that if I started elaborating and I got, you know, it's like going over this is like saying sick them to me. So it's like I'm just I'm just ready to charge. OK, and because and listen, it is because 
I want to honor God with his order. And I know that disorder causes dysfunction. And we have so many families that are being destroyed out there. And it doesn't have to happen. And if we will see a return to God's order, we will have God's blessing on our families and our children. I am so, listen to me very closely. I was weeping this week in prayer to God because I want to impact, by the grace of God, I want to impact this generation that is coming before I die. I want to be that voice out there or one of them, not the only one, but one of them that preaches the truth without compromise and says it boldly and plainly and straightforward and sets up and prepares a generation. I was just reading in Chronicles, uh, David was dying, but David, he prepared everything for Solomon. He prepared the silver. He prepared the gold. He prepared the right, he prepared the blueprints for the temple. He prepared it all for him. He laid that foundation. And when I go to sleep with my fathers, as the Bible says, I want this generation and my son's generation to have that firm foundation in Christ and to unapologetically stand for the faith once delivered unto the saints and not to get limp-wristed in the face of Jezebel. And this Baphomet spirit, this androgynous Baphomet spirit that is out there. And the sad thing is that this same feminist spirit, this, this unisex spirit has filled our churches today. Some of you are feeling the effects of that same spirit. And some of you have some things to weed out of your relationship, to set the order and get things right and do things the right way and follow good biblical order. The husband being the head, the wife following, the husband loving the wife, caring for the wife, loving the children, caring for the children, the wife guiding the home, being a keeper at home, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Amen. That's what the Bible says. But you know what? You're going to have to lay down some things to do that. You're going to have to lay down your pride and your own self-will and everything that you want. As a man, you have to do that, and as a lady, you have to do that. If you're venturing out into everything else besides learning to be a good mother and a good wife and putting your focus on that, then you are going to get distracted. It puts different ambitions, it puts different emotions, it puts different perspective. When you send, you know, when you send a wife to work for another man, what you do is you change the dynamic of that relationship. Because you're placing your wife under subjection to another man. And you know what God said? No, she was to be in subjection to her own husband. That's what the Bible says. Submit to her own husband, not another man. It changes things. It changes the relationship. That's why we correct those things. It don't all get corrected overnight, amen? But it gets corrected. We grow through these things. We learn through these things. Everybody is at different phases of, of, of learning and growth with this. The way you receive these types of messages is this. I learn what I can, and I plan to do right. Beating yourself up over the past and trying to do that. No, have a goal. Set it. Um, purpose it in your heart like Daniel did, that you'll do right and move forward. That's right, and stick to it. Repent of anything you need to repent of and move forward. All right? That's what we do. The devil wants you to take this and 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 just become angry about it, become bitter about it, become uh, rebellious, start bucking up against it. Because you know what, it, it is straightforward because it's needed. Again, the only reason why Trump is in office right now is because he was a man that just spoke forward, and I don't even trust him. I'm just telling you, but he spoke like a man. He got up there and just went straight forward, just like a tiger. And everybody was so sick of that limp-wristed dude for eight years, that absolutely effeminate Fruit Loop president that we had, and I'm sorry, that's what he is, and a devil. 
I believe he's a sodomite. Absolutely believe he's a sodomite. Absolutely believe, don't believe that cover he's got. Yeah. I don't believe it. I think he's a sodomite. Absolutely. Just research Jeremiah Wright. Research the arranged marriages to cover up to cover up uh, homosexuals. And then the prostitute that he, the male prostitute that he did know, is dead. Yep. Anyway, so that's that's another story. They're all devils, but I'm just telling you the truth. That's that's what it is. Anyway, so so the point is that you know what? That's why he got it, and it's straight for. And I believe there are some men out there and some ladies that just want preachers and people and men just to be straightforward and just tell the truth. Tell me what I need to hear, even though it hurts. Amen. And God honors that. Because by the world standards and by fundamentalist standards, I shouldn't even still be here. But God is able to make you stand. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for the truth of it, Lord. We thank you for these lessons that we so badly need to hear. And Father, we just pray that you'd help this generation, Lord. Help us to reset the order where it needs to be. And then help us to set the order moving forward the right way. And the evil fruit of feminism will be destroyed. We pray, Father, that you bless the food to our bodies and the time we have together. Thank you so much for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue on with this, uh, what we've been doing. This menace of feminism. And we're talking about the fruit of feminism, the fruits of feminism, and uh, the evil fruit of feminism and what it's produced. Uh and we're going to continue on. The last thing that we talked about, uh, let's see, where did we finish up? We finish up with, I believe it was the masculinity of, of women. Now we're going to talk about, you know, the lower birth rate. I think this is very important. What did God say in Genesis chapter 9? He said, be fruitful and multiply, Right? And replenish the earth. That's what he said. Now, feminism teaches the opposite. It pushed the opposite. All right? It pushed the absolute opposite of what it was uh, of uh, God's design. So lowering the birth rate is one of the fruits of feminism. It's one of the fruit of feminism. It's to, it's to stop that. Stop the birth rate. That's, I mean, population control. There's so many other ways you can go with this but that explains this. But it, that's all part of feminist goal is if you take, you know, it makes common sense. If you take the lady out of the home, you're not going to have babies. The focus is going to change. It's going to change. It just does. Okay, so he goes on to say, it is not surprising that the feminists are concerning themselves with the birth rate. They have become obsessed with the idea that too many children are coming into the world. They are therefore devising ways and means to lower the birth rate. They are unwilling to bear children themselves and would not permit others to bear them without first obtaining the official assent of the feminist. Already feminist clubs are taking active steps in this regard. They are attempting to supplant the Bible by social eugenics and curtail the birth rate by prevention. Eugenics, right, uh, survival of the fittest. The husband and wife who are too poor to properly rear children shall not be permitted to have them. The cradle must have the proper environment or remain empty. With them, the command multiply and replenish the earth was only a myth in an old book known as Genesis. Had it been authoritative, it would have, in their judgment, only been applicable to the well-to-do. Since more than half the children in America are born in homes of comparative poverty, what would be the result? It may not be amiss to recall the fact that some of those who have ruled our nation came from the homes of the very poor. According to the feminist leaders, these should have never been allowed to enter the world. The command to bear children was not restricted to the rich or well-to-do. The rich regulate this question for themselves, and that too, without aid of the sexually wise feminists, and the poor should have the same privilege. Strangely enough, the leaders of this movement are often spinsters who are minus even the motherly instinct. And while it is not necessary for every woman to be a mother, it is necessary for every woman to have the motherly instinct. Amen. 
Now, here's where it comes funny, because there's always got to be one of these coolies around here that's doing something bad. And uh, just like that comic book, <laughs> right? That's something. Oh, boy. Uh, it is. It is. It With trouble. It is very popular. <laughs> with trouble. Anyway, Miss Winifred Harper Cooley, the wife of Reverend George Elliot Cooley, one of the most famed of all feminists, says this. The na- Now, this lady was a was a contemporary and a friend of Margaret Sanger. She's listed with Margaret Sanger in many places. I, I haven't been able to verify how well they knew each other, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking pretty well. Okay? And we're going to talk about, about Margaret Sanger uh, also because... Oops, let me see here. See if I can find it here. Um, she was actually very big on the uh, eugenics movement. Margaret Sanger, she she hated God. She's a God hater for sure. And um, we're going to talk about her in a little bit here. So I'll have those quotes up there to show you that. All right. So this is what this lady says. This fa- she, was a, she was a part of the New Womanhood, a magazine that was called the New Womanhood at the time. The natural result of following in nature's unthinking paths or obeying the church's rigid requirements was an enormous increase of population, checked only by war and pestilence, the result of man's ignorance of ethics and sanitation. Fortunately, however, a new individual freedom, often termed individual selfishness, possibly with no thought for the changed conditions, has taken upon itself the solving of the problem of an overpopulated world and has refused to rear large families. There is no greater evidence of civilization than the reduction of the number of progeny, progeny, which implies an intelligent control of passion. See, she says, she says that if you, you know, if you have an intelligent control of passion, you won't have children. And a tender regard by men for the many rights their wives should enjoy besides that of motherhood. The large family is a thing of the past, as is the supreme authority of the monarch and the church over the conduct of the individual. The problem of propagation is being solved by the thinking few, by a process of elimination. Perhaps more important than all else is the benefit accruing to children from their scarcity. (laughs) What a witch. (laughs) Who shall say that any couple, old or young, rich or poor, intellectual or insipid, philanthropic or indifferent, shall not enjoy congenial companionship, romantic love, quiet domesticity, or co-labor in professions if they have satisfied society by marrying without being forced to rear unwelcome offspring for a world already overstocked and unable under present economic conditions to supply food for all of its inhabitants. What a nice lady. <laughs> Woo, and her and her husband was a pastor. <laughs> wow. That'd be like married to the devil. Wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness. What a devil. The birth rate for the first six months of 1922 was 22.7 per thousand. For the corresponding of 1921, it was 24.8. Thus, it is seen that the birth rate in six months has decreased more than 2%. Surely this is alarming enough, yet the natural and inevitable result of feminism. This is where the eugenics moves in, and this is where this new womanhood moved in. See, there were this group of feminists that they were tied to the suffrage, the women's suffrage movement. After the women's suffrage movement, that wasn't enough for them. Those feminists piggybacked on the suffrage movement because they wanted to really come out and roar against biblical womanhood and biblical manhood, and they wanted to stop it dead in its tracks, and they were not going to stop until they got what they wanted, and that was the that was basically abolishing the sexes. Like the evolutionists, like the evolutionists, they would restrict parentage to the physically fit. They agree with Nietzsche, the mad German philosopher, that the weak and botched have no right to live. You understanding? 
They, uh, let's see, to this end, many shall not be permitted to marry, and if married, shall be divorced or made sterile. By the way, the United States government did this down south. You can watch a documentary, older adults, don't watch it with your children, called The Kinsey Report, made by Chris Pinto. In The Kinsey Report, it's very vexing, very vexing. No children should watch it. But with The Kinsey Report, what you find is, is you find... Down south, they sterilized poor black girls and girls of poverty down south. They sterilized them so they could never have children. All part of eugenics. The state did it. This is what these monsters wanted. To this end, many shall not be permitted to marry, and if married, shall be divorced or made sterile. The physically unfit at all hazards shall not be permitted to perpetuate their species. They go a step further further than the evolutionist who believes in the survival of the fittest in not permitting the birth of the unfit. According to their Christless contention, every child must be the product of scientific eugenics and the goal, the superman, the neuter superwoman. The natural result of this movement would be to select a number of the best men and women for breeding purposes and carry out a plan of scientific propagation. This may be all right for those who claim to to have descended from the monkey, or as they prefer saying, are genetically related to the monkey, but it does not commend itself to those who were created in the image of God. Speaking of the problem of propagation, the feminist evolutionistic Mrs. Cooley says this, Our first ancestor, the amoeba or tiny piece of protoplasm swimming in the green ooze of the ocean had no pains or problems in reproducing itself and giving the world a new generation. It's simply divided in two and so simple and indiscriminate were its organs and functions that each of its new selves was provided with a stomach, the first and primal necessity of being. No, of course, Mrs. Cooley speaks for self, and her own ancestors, and perhaps should be considered authority on the subject of her own origin and ancestors. <laughs> That's funny. Statistics show that less than one-fourth of the married people of America are producing one-half of the children. Some years since, the birth rate of the foreign population of America was 36 to the 1,000, or nearly double what it was among American-born white people. Same thing today, too. Probably worse. Speaking of his own times, Benjamin Franklin said, one and all considered, each married couple in this country produces eight children. That was the average. Eight. At the present time, the average family is about one half this number. It is claimed that since 1810, the families of Yale graduates have grown smaller year to year. Mrs. John John Van Voorst, in her book entitled The Woman Who Toils, says this. Among the American-born women of the United States, the percentage of sterility is great than in any greater than any country in the world unless it be France. The factories are full of old maids, and the ballrooms in the worldly centers are full of old maids. For natural obligations are substituted the fictitious duties of clubs, meetings, committees, professions, a thousand unworthy occupations. So, you know, eugenics was their goal, okay? That that was their goal. And I'll get one of the queen feminists, wicked witches, was Margaret Sanger. Okay? And I want to give you 13 things about Margaret Sanger that people don't really know. Number one, she proposed allowing Congress to solve population problems by appointing a parliament of population. She was a eugenicist, and she was just like this lady here. She was a feminist. This is what she wanted. Directors representing the various branches of science in the parliament would direct and control the population through birth rates and immigration and direct its distribution over the country according to a national need consistent with taste, fitness, and interest of the individuals. That's what she said. Number two, Sanger called the various methods of population control, including abortion, defending the unborn against their own disabilities. Uh Uh-huh. 
Number three, Sanger believed that the United States should keep the doors of immigration closed to the entrance of certain aliens whose conditions is known to be detrimental to the stamina of the race, such as feeble-minded, idiots, morons, insane, syphilitic, epileptic, criminal, professional prostitutes, and others in this class barred by the immigration laws of 1924. Yeah. Four, Sanger advocated a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny, progeny is already tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. Number five, people from whom considered people whom Sanger considered unfit she wrote, should be sent to farmlands and homesteads where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives. Number six, she was an advocate of a proposal called the American Baby Code. The results desired are obviously selective births, she wrote. According to Sanger, the code would protect society against the propagation and increase of the unfit. Number seven, while advocating for the American Baby Code, she argued that marriage licenses should provide couples with the right to only a common household but not parenthood. In fact, couples should have to obtain a permit to become parents. Article 3, a marriage license shall in itself give husband and wife only the right to a common household and not the right to parenthood. And let me stop here and tell you something. The state doesn't have the right to tell anybody they can be married or not be married. It's not in the state's jurisdiction. Uh, marriage is not. Marriage is a covenant and a consummation. Marriage is done before God. It is, it is, it is a contract, or excuse me, it is a covenant between God, between the wife and the husband. It is not a contract with the state. Amen. I don't get permission to get married from the government. I don't need their permission at all, period, to do that. It's not their right. It's not their duty. It's not, it's not under their supervision or jurisdiction to do that. But look at what they're saying, though, what they proposed. A marriage license shall in itself give husband and wife only the right. Wait a minute. You don't give me the right to be married. You devils. Who do you think you are? You don't give me the right to do that. God ordained marriage. Right? Not civil government. I don't need permission to get married from the civil government. At all. Amen. That's the truth. Because now homos stand in line and they get permission to get married. Well, let them have it. Let them have it. Last thing I need is that bunch of nuts trying to tell me what a marriage is. They can't even figure it out. Marriage is between a man and a woman. What business do we have going for them for permission for anything like that? Bunch of fools. But they want to regulate the children if you see that. Oh, you don't have a, this, this marriage license only gives you the right to do this. Article four, no woman shall have the legal right to bear a child and no man shall have the right to become a father without a permit for parenthood. This is what she proposed. Bunch of Nazis. Yep. Number five, permits for parenthood shall be issued upon application by city, county, or state authorities to married couples, providing they are financially able to support the expected child, have the qualifications needed for proper rearing of the child, have no trans transmissible diseases, and on the woman's part, no medical indication that maternity is likely to result in death or permanent injury to health. Sounds like to me somebody had a God complex. See why I hate feminism?
Number six, no permit for parenthood shall be valid for more than one birth. You know what I'd like to see? Any of those butch lesbians stand in front of me and tell me that to my face. That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see any of the devils try it. And their little pansy husbands, too. The same thing. All that sounds highly revolutionary, and it might be impossible to put the scheme into practice, Sanger wrote. She added, what is social planning without a quota? By the way, that's called America Needs a Code for Babies, March 27, 1934. Margaret Sanger Papers, Library of Congress. That's why I hate Planned Parenthood, too. They, they watch everything I do anyway. They, if I put something out there, they're listening to it. You listen to this. You need to be saved, you wicked devils. You need to be born again, you bunch of baby murders. You need to get right with God. You shed a lot of innocent blood. God's not, God's not going to hold you blameless for that. You better repent and believe Jesus Christ before it's too late. You're all going to die and go to hell. Amen. This has been a public service announcement. They listen. I'm serious. Like they'll, I've gotten letters from them before where they're like, they're typing stuff out to me and sending me emails about different things. Like, Keep listening. Amen. You might get saved. You might quit murdering babies if you keep listening. That'd be a blessing, wouldn't it? I think their attorney was listening to me. I felt honored by that. We haven't been out there for a while. Anyway, number eight, she believed that large families were detrimental to society. The most serious evil of our times is that of encouraging the bringing into the world of large families. The most immoral practice of the day is breeding too many children, she wrote. It's hard to call that thing a lady. I'm telling you, it really is. She's a woman, but she ain't a lady. I just don't know how any man could sit there and listen to that witch say that and not explode. I just, I don't know how. Because if I heard that, I would just explode on her right there. She said the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Woman in the New Race, 1920, Chapter 5, The Wickedness of Creating Large Families. Oh, seriously, she actually wrote, wrote that. Nine, she argued that motherhood must be efficient. Birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectiveness, or of those who will become defectives, Sanger wrote. Woman and the New Race, 1920, Chapter 18, The Goal. Oh, this makes my skin crawl. Oh. Wow. Number 10, population control. She wrote, would bring about the materials of a new race. If we are to develop in America a new race with a racial soul, we must keep the birth rate within the scope of our ability to understand as well as to educate. We must not encourage reproduction beyond our capacity to assimilate our numbers so as to make the coming generation into such physically fit, mentally capable, socially alert individuals as our the ideal of a democracy, Sanger wrote, woman in the new race, the materials of the new race, 1920. Number 11, Sanger wrote that an excess of population must be reduced. War, famine, poverty, and oppression of the workers will continue while woman makes life cheap, she wrote. Mothers, at whatever cost, she must emerge from her ignorance and assume her responsibility. Number 12, we do not want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Sanger wrote, letter to Dr. Clarence Gamble on December 10th, 1939. Number 13, in an interview with Mike Wallace in 1957, Sanger said, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children to the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being practically. 
delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just marked when they were born. That, to me, is the greatest sin that people can can commit, she said. That lady's creepy. Anyway, so that's that's eugenics. That's the eugenic side of it. That's the abortion side, the eugenic side. Next, an increase in the number of divorces. The alarming increase in the number of divorces threatens the destruction of the American home and the collapse of our social system. The home is the recognized citadel of our nation and the hope of the whole earth. And when this goes, nothing but confusion, worse, confounded awaits us. Divorce means the disintegration of the home, and no one knows this better than the feminists. In fact, the feminist chief contention is concerning the place of a woman in the home. See, here's the thing. This is is divorce that is brought on by by a lack of of contentment by trying to pull that woman out of the home and make her something else make her not content and make her think that your life is not good enough as a wife you need to be somebody else right discontentment if i can get them discontented the satan can't just like he did eve he got her discontented right and then she sinned against god all right. Feminists are crying aloud for great laxity in divorce laws. At all events, the increase in divorces have kept pace with the advance of the feminist movement. The wife that feels no obligation to husband or home will not likely be willing to continue the married state. The ratio of divorces to marriages is greatly today than at any period of American history. Recently, in one day in the city of Louisville, there were 40 divorces granted, only two of this number on scriptural grounds. In speaking of the subject of divorce and married life, she says this, Undoubtedly, many men in the past strictly adhered to the seventh commandment, yet made their wives so utterly wretched that these might have welcomed a rival who would have engrossed their husband's attention and left them some measure of individuality and freedom. Do you know what, they meant? You know what she meant by that? That they would go get a mistress. Right? That they would go get a mistress so that lady could be left alone. That's what she wanted. That's what she was pro- promoting. Dr. Holtzclaw points out that for a period of five, listen to this, for a period of 500 years, Rome had but one divorce. And when the divorce laws were changed, the empire soon went down in shame and disgrace. Listen to this. In his monumental work, Gibbon attributes the downfall of Rome to the divorce laws. In France, divorce was made easy, and it was not long till the revolution followed. In a given period, there were 700,000 divorces in America, and within the same time, only 76 in Canada. See, the feminists wanted to push divorce to attack the establishment of marriage. All right? Not there's divorce on biblical grounds. The Bible talks about it, okay? But they want a divorce for anything. Because they didn't want the union of marriage to be there. They wanted to destroy 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 the very fiber uh, fiber of marriage. Okay? They wanted to destroy it, to stop it, to end it. They want free and open love, they call it. By all means, we should have a uniform federal divorce law. He says, as our laws now stand, one may legally be married one state and a bigamist in another. Dr. Holtzclaw says that in our states, divorce. Okay, so he's talking about the divorce and marriage laws, which we understand. Okay, uh, certainly no nation can long survive where the ratio of divorces to marriages is as great as it is now as in our own country. At present, the increase in number of divorces far exceeds that of the birth rate. According to the word of God, there's but one cause. Okay, so Lady Rhonda, one of the leading militant suffragists of England. Well, there's actually more than one cause, but this man says there's one cause. There's this cause. Then there's if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. There's a few other causes. There's a few other things in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter seven, which reiterates that Deuteronomy chapter 24, which talks of that too as well. So there's a little more than that, but anyway, we won't get into that. Go back and listen to the divorce or marriage series that we did on that. And you'll find the answers there. Lady Rhonda, one of the leading militant suffragists of England and a leading figure in the British business world who was denied a seat in the house of Lords left her husband. Just why any militant suffragist would wish a husband is not apparent. Should feminism triumph, divorce will become the order of the day. Already the divorce evil threatens the very existence of our social fabric. And it does. Because people, they say, well, irreconcilable differences, they, anything. Just You don't even have to have a reason, pretty much. You just make one up, okay? And, and I mean, that's, so long as women are taught and believe that the mission and ministry of motherhood is slavish and monstrous, it is but natural that they should rebel against the obligations and duties of married life. 
make you think, oh, you're just a slave. You're this, you're that. And what does that do? That creates that discontent in their heart and makes it easy for them just to leave. In every age in civilization, the home has been regarded as the center and glory of woman's sphere and work. This can never be changed until there is a change in the sex and the nature of woman. The very fact that they are to perpetuate the race by bearing children necessitates that their ministry be largely in the home. Okay? What does the Bible say about that? Turn to Titus chapter 2. It says in verse number three that the age women likewise that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. What does that mean? To be serious, to have a serious assessment of things, right? Not to be carried away, not to be silly women laden with sins, not to be carried out from house to house, but to be home and to caring for their husband, right? And their children. That they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. What's your focus, lady? What is it to be? To be sober, to love your husband, to love your children. To be discreet, right? To have some discretion. Chaste, right? Pure, moral purity. Keepers at home, not keepers of the home, Keepers at home. There's a difference. The new versions say keepers of the home. The King James Bible says keepers at home. As opposed to the Proverbs 7 woman that is what? In the street running around. Her feet, ab- her feet abide not where? In her house. See the difference? That doesn't mean you can never leave your house. You have to stay barefoot and pregnant. You can wear shoes. I've been asked that before. What do you you believe in keeping them barefoot and pregnant? No, they can wear shoes. At least one pair. Right? Right? If your inner feminist is roaring right now, you know you have a problem, okay? Just <laughs> oh, I, I had fun with it. <laughs> What's that, barefoot and pregnant? Oh, they can have shoes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why I like saying it. <sighs> okay, back then. to be just <laughs> to be discreet. Yeah, they have a lot of shoes. <laughs> to be discreet, chase keepers at home, good, obedient to their own parents or to their own husbands. Sorry, I was reading something else. Some of the children to their own, to their own husbands. Sorry, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know why God's word is blasphemed because. The order is not followed. So blaspheme is God's word. They say, what, you don't, if other people see this, that Christians don't abide by this, what do they say? Well, you don't believe God's word. If husbands don't abide by this and wives don't. Okay. So the Bible says that, that they are to be these things. Okay. Um, Which is different than, you know, which is the opposite of feminism. Feminism is like, nope, get her out of the house. The very fact that they are to perpetuate the race by bearing children necessitates that their ministry be largely in the home. Until there is a change in that, okay, so we talked about that. This unalterable fiat of fate cannot be reversed until the woman becomes the male or the man female. Or both transformed into the neuter gender. That's what we have now, right? The eternal feminine is an everlasting fact, and the real man and the woman have a right to thank God that this is true. Let us thank God that there is no 
divorced from mother, and no mother ever asked to be divorced from her child. All right, so that's that. That's uh, that's that one. Uh, the divorce rate and everything skyrocketing uh, through that. And that was, you know, when women had to have rights, that changed everything. Because men could no longer really leave their home. Because women could do whatever they wanted to do then. So it changed things. Next is the increase of licentiousness. Or fornication. You had to have, with the rise of the feminist movement, you were going to have an increase of fornication in the land. You have to. I mean, it's just, it's, it's inevitable. And when I see these women out there on the streets, the way that they're dressed now and how bold they are and how brassy they are to dress like that and they don't care. By common consent, the sin of our decade is the sin of, of fornication there is there is more of lust fornication and adultery than any period of the world's civilized history boy that's for sure during the past year he says at this time 60,000 young women dropped out of sight as suddenly as though the earth had swallowed them up they were practically all victims of the monster of lust and the demon of adultery they played with fire and were consumed that was all the time now but it used to be a shame it used to be a shame. Now it's not a shame. In their eyes. The daily papers are filled with the accounts of scandals, wrecked homes, and ruined lives. Adultery has become a commonplace in social life. Fornication with many is no longer deemed disgraceful, and its only shame is that of being detected. When detected, the social injunction is not go and sin no more, but go be caught no more. It's true, isn't it? People say, well, Jesus, he didn't say that to the woman that was caught in adultery. Yeah, but he said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and sin some more. He didn't sanctify her sins. He didn't send her on her way a whore. He sent her change and said, go and sin no more. This movement has unquestionably contributed to breakdown of the natural barriers between the sexes and the lowering of the standard of virtue among men and women. Nor is the shameful licentiousness limited to the obscure and lowly, but it is all too frequent among the famed and wealthy. That's what we see in Hollywood, right? We see it broadcasted. Where do you think most people learn about this stuff? They watch television. They watch movies. They watch videos. They watch all these things, and they see all this activity. And they, all these, you know what they do with people like Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana. They took her from this little girl that was borderline, and then they turned her into a raging whore. And all those girls followed. All those girls wanted to dress like her. All those girls wanted to be like her. See how that works? That's Disney. Bunch of devils. If we are to judge by the papers, the leak is at the top rather than the bottom. This may be accounted for by the fact that the influence of feminism is most pronounced with his with this class. The doing away with long existing standards of dress and deportment and the clamor for equal rights has not been in vain in the devil. Feminism has sowed the seed of and our nation is reaping the harvest of disgrace, death and hell. When feminism has reached its height in France, the name of mistress and mother were often synonyms. Shall we profit by this sad example? As lightly as we may esteem it, feminism is today's, today America's great menace. Napoleon wisely said, the need of France is good mothers. True. Feminism does not produce good mothers. Some of the feminists are now boldly advocating that every woman has the right to choose the father of her children, that she is under no obligation to enter into a marriage contract that she may become a mother they claim the further right of the woman though unmarried or un married or unmarried to choose different fathers for their children the following is taken from a tract recently received and written by a for forward feminist she says this all women shall freely choose the man or men for their children every woman shall have the full right to choose if she cares a different man for each child she is willing to bring into the world no woman shall let herself and her children be supported by a man yeah. 
It hardly needs to be said that the author of such infamy should be in one or two places, the penitentiary or the lunatic asylum. Another feminist writes that her daughter, about to be married, will not take her husband's name, but will live with him for a brief period and then go to Europe for a change of scene. Obviously, we have entered upon a period of social corruption and insanity, and the end is not yet. The fact that reputable, reputable newspapers will feature such rottenness speaks poorly for the papers and their readers. See what they were talking about back then? All you see is wickedness today, like the Drudge Report. Everything you see on the Drudge Report is wicked. They've got to put all kinds of wicked stuff up there just to show you the most debased, wicked things of society. They have to show you it. The spectacle of the spinster traveling around lecturing on eugenics and venereal diseases before mixed assemblies is as, is as pitiful as it is putrid. Surely they should address themselves to subjects they are supposed to know about and concern, concerning which they can speak with authority. Such performances are the natural outgrowth of exaggerated feminism. It is passing strange that the feminist orator has little or nothing to do to say concerning the purity and uplift of the home or the rescue of the fallen of her own sex. It would seem that this would present an inviting field for all her ingenuity and energy. If she would talk more of the wrongs and their remedies, she would probably accomplish much more for the good of her sex. In our, in our entire race. So anyway, so he talks about that, the, the fornication. And it, it, it makes sense. The Bible, now we understand that if a woman gets raped, that's not her fault. I'm not saying that. But the Bible says that, you know what? It shows in the Bible that women weren't out running around by themselves. They had somebody with them. They had a, a father or a, or, a, or a brother or somebody that was with them. What happened to Dinah when she went out to look at the daughters of the land? Right? She was seduced. Right? Why? Because her brothers weren't with her. No protection. That's the example of, of ladies being, girls being off by themselves. They shouldn't be like that. It's not right. See, that's old fashioned. No, that's Bible. It's always in fashion. It's always right. That's Bible, friend. That's what it is. So you don't trust your daughter? Not with a bunch of devils, no. Oh, I don't trust with a bunch of devils, no. Do you? Ask yourself that question, do you? Go to uh, you can look at Numbers chapter thirty, and you can see the responsibility of a, of a of a man to his wife and to his daughters. I preached on it. You can go find it. I forgot what it's called now. I can't remember it, but Numbers chapter thirty, I believe that's the chapter. The next, uh, besides fornication, was an increase in crime among women. A recent issue of the Louisville Times contained an account of nine murder trials in which women were the defendants. You would have never heard such a thing, ever, until feminism started. He gives a bunch of examples of, you know, all these women, which wouldn't mean anything to us because we're not, we don't know any of them, but thus it appears that women or the militant branch of the sex are claiming their right to equality even in the line of murder. Here as elsewhere, it is not rights or liberty that some of these unsexed creatures are claiming, but rather license. The very fact that nine or more or less prominent women should be on trial at one time for murder is quite enough to shock a nation. Look at the w prisons full of women today. You don't think feminism has something to do with it? If they were home with their daddies, their daddies kept them home and took care of them, they wouldn't be there. Right? It will be granted that hitherto liquor has been the cause of most of the crimes of our country. So you're talking about drugs and alcohol, which we know that's been pretty bad, right? But um, anyway, so... Yeah, one more here, and then we are... Well, wait, what do we got? Let me see here. Yep, actually, this is the same one. Okay. Yep, one more, and then we're done here. Uh, feminism in the church, it's called the utter disregard of the teaching of God's word. This is really short, so it doesn't really deal with the churches as much, but it just it just kind of 
branches off into it, so it's not very long. So we'll finish up with this one because it's not very long. Okay, the feminists, uh, because we're going to talk about women speaking in mixed public assemblies um, later, more in depth, has been abundantly shown in another volume. As might have been surmised, other evils have followed in its train. The following is taken from a recent issue of one of our daily papers. You know, what happened was they, they, the feminism crept into the churches. And we're not going to cover this solely here. It's just going to be a little bit of a snippet of it, and then we're going to end this. But um, in Winchester, Indiana, November 18th, it says here, a stage habit that musical comedy stars employed to arouse enthusiasm among audiences has been adopted by the Sunday School of the First Presbyterian Church of Winchester, whose superintendent now asks the pupils to whistle the tune of the last hymn as they leave the church. Children just learning to lisp their lessons and grown-ups of Bible class age all join. What he's saying is they're changing. It's changed the dynamic. Entertainment got more brought in when women were put in charge of things in churches. It just it just naturally changed things. The Sunday school has an orchestra of bobbed-haired girls playing stringed instruments. The beats bobtail, and everybody knows what bobtail beats. Some of the churches have young ladies for ushers in order to attract the young men to the church. This may perhaps catch the young men. What's that? Yeah. But it will hold will it hold them? Are they worth holding if it requires this to catch them? It's a question to ask yourself. The Northern Baptist Convention has already witnessed the spectacular stun of a woman president. The stool of repentance should certainly come next. It is worthy to note that this spiritual disgrace did not come until the leadership of the convention became gangrened with evolution and destructive criticism. The Southern Baptist Convention has admitted women as mission as messengers and given them representation on committees, and the end is not yet. It goes without saying that membership in a body of this character carries with it all the rights and privileges of the body. What next? Would it not be entirely in order to appoint a woman as a chairman of a committee and permit her to speak to her report? See, he was talking about women speaking in the assembly, which we're going to get to uh, the next the next lesson on feminism in the church. May the time not come when a woman shall preside over the convention and another preach the introductory sermon. It was freely predicted when women were admitted as messengers that they would claim no further rights in this regard. But time has clearly demonstrated this was the opening wedge, and it is now evident that even some of our southern feminists are prepared to go to the logical limit of their contention. At the recent meeting of the SBC, a woman came very near being elected vice president of the convention. What does the Bible say about women in authority? What does the Bible say about in the church? Shows no woman in any authority position in the church at all, period. There were no female apostles. There are no women that were ordained in the New Testament. And I'll tell you everything you need to know. And that the office says that the husband of one wife. The writer really wonders if not a few of our pro-feminists have not been unconsciously influenced by the desire to curry favor with the women that they may thereby further the interests they represent. If so, they have their reward. The officers of the National Woman's Party representing women of the 36 states in their meeting in Washington November 11, 1922, unanimously adopted the following resolution, that women shall no longer be debarred from the priesthood or ministry or any position of authority in the church, but equally with men shall participate in ecclesiastical offices and dignities. Why do we have to vote on something the Bible already spoke on? This is but the natural result of the movement, though many who begun with it little dreamed the destined goal. Some of our churches are now manned by feminine pastors. That's true. It would seem that the command to be keepers at home and bear children is hardly consistent with the uninterrupted duties of the preacher and pastor. Let us thank God and take courage that the petticoated pulpits are still across the river. May some of us not be pardoned for cherishing the hope that they will get into the river should they attempt to cross. So... Um, that Reverend Cooley's wife said this the new woman, in the New Womanhood. She said this, Thus the woman who bore her Lord the most sons attained the highest glory, and so much stronger ever is love of approbation and a sense of well-doing and feminine consciousness than physical cowardice that women gladly, eagerly, repeatedly, repeatedly when though through the valley of the shadow of death that they might bring forth a man-child. See how she hates motherhood so much? She hates it. 
This was the condition reached in Bible times. The ancient scribes who complied, compiled the Old Testament made the Lord say, Go forth and multiply. This having once become incorporated into what has for centuries been regarded as the very word of God, compelled obedience even from those who were beginning to doubt the economic necessity of large families. Priests desiring to strengthen infant religions called upon superstitions to add her command and incorporate into their creeds the idea that the Lord had an especial blessing for those who produced the most numerous progen progeny. Well, nobody said that. This is a characteristic valuation of the worth of the Bible by the average feminist who is unwilling to be bound by the laws of God or nature. One of our, our most thoughtful writers says this, I shrink with horror from a godless woman. There seems to be no light in her, no glory proceeding from her. I can see why men do not become religious. It is a hard thing. It is, at least, if experience and observation are to be relied on for a man whose will has been made by stern encounters in the great battle of life, who is conscious of power and accustomed to have the minds around him bend to his, to his who possesses the pride of manhood and self-esteem that springs naturally in the mind of one in his possession to become as a little child. Woman has only to recognize her dependence upon one higher than man, and in doing this is obliged to do but little violence to her habits of thought, and no violence at all, to such sentiments of independence as stand most in the way of man. So I say that a godless woman is a monstrous woman. She is an offensive woman. Even an utterly godless man, unless he be debauched and debased to the position of an animal, deems such a woman without excuse. He looks on her with suspicion. He would not have such a one to take care of his children. He would not trust her. The worst feature of feminism has perhaps been its infidelity. This is but natural in view of the fact that the movement is clearly contrary to the teachings of the scriptures. It is sad, but a well-known fact, that a majority of the leaders of this movement do not even claim to be Christians. As far as the writer's knowledge extends, not one of them are prominent in the churches. Not a few of them express contempt for the teaching of Paul and refer to him as a disgruntled old bachelor. This is not surprising as they well know they cannot hold the teachings of feminism and the teachings of Paul at one and the same time. They will love the one and hate the other. It is quite safe to say that feminism has made more infidels among women than any other single agency. Many who were formerly devout and active church members have lost their spiritual power through the sinister influence of this destructive movement. They perhaps little dreamed when they allied themselves with the movement that it would mar their religious life and influence, but it did. Their activities in the churches have decreased in the same ratio that their activities have increased in the woman movement. Whatever the grievances of women, and they are not a few, they will only be intensified by feminism. The one and sovereign cure is God and his enduring word. Martin, in his work of the, on the unrest of women, well says this, But politics will never do the whole business of pacifying human life and making people content to live it. It never did. It will not now. The great agent in that is religion. The great asset of our civilization, incomparably more important than all our astonishing apparatus for promoting physical comfort, is the mind of Christ. That mind penetrated all the perplexities of human relations and solved the problem of life in all its phases. It is on the spirit of Christ, working through individuals and shaping and inspiring our politics, that we must count to straighten out the tangles in our affairs. That is the only force that is equal to so huge a task, that working perpetually to bring justice, sanity, and love into human co concerns can make men wise enough to be men and women patient enough to be women. That is the only force that can make labor duly tolerant of capital and capital duly considerate of labor. That can keep the spiritual in control of the material and yet leave apparatus free to accumulate and wealth to increase and beauty to develop and can bring liberty and opportunity to all creatures to work out all there is in them that is good. So he finishes with this here. We'll be done here for today. Time was when infidelity was almost entirely restricted to men. It was very unusual to hear a woman question any statement found in the scriptures. But alas, we have fallen upon different and decadent days. The writer is personally acquainted with not a few feminists, 
yet he is not acquainted with one who does not doubt or deny some portion of the scriptures. This is not surprising in view of the fact that the feminist movement is directly opposed to God's word and God's plan with women. If, wo- if woman is to play the truant with God and the wonderful work he has given her to do, what can be the hope of the coming generations? It is no longer the threatening cloud. Even now, the pitiless storm is breaking in fury about us. Bolshevism and anarchy, which magnify the feminist movement, unless checked, promise speedy and universal chaos. And he was right, because that's exactly what happened. That social anarchy moved in. The family has been destroyed. The family has been completely broke down and destroyed. You know? And that movement has spread like wildfire. It's it's in every organization. It's in everything. Now, you no longer have organizations ran by men and exclusively ran by men. You have the infiltration of feminism into every aspect of life. You have it in the church. You have it in the home. You have it in the government. You have it everywhere. Men can no longer be men because that would not be equal with women. So in every aspect of life now, besides those that would earnestly contend for the faith, which is once delivered unto the saints, and stand firm on the diversity of the sexes and how God created them and how God wishes to maintain them the way that they are, and we are not allowed to turn from that. We are not allowed to change God's order. We are not allowed to mess with it. We are not allowed to change it. Be, if if those people don't stand firm, if if we don't stand firm, if we don't listen, we need to stop blurring the lines. You teach your daughters to be daughters and your sons to be men. That's what you you teach the daughters to be wives and to be keepers at home and your sons to provide and to be men. You teach them differently. You don't teach, you don't, there's nothing in the Bible that says your daughter is supposed to go out and work and make money and take care of herself. Show me one thing in the Bible where it shows that. One thing. Where you, where as a husband and a father, I'm not required to take care of it. Here's another thing. Show me where my wife is supposed to go out and make the money and take care of the home. And finance a home. Show me where that is. See, this right here, listen to me. This this doctrine of keepers at home, this doctrine has made me more enemies than anything I've ever preached. And I and I, I mean that wholeheartedly. I'm talking about I've preached on things like Hollywood. I've preached on things like Disney. I've preached on entertainment. I've preached on a, a great number of things. But the one thing that separates the men from the boys, the one thing that separates the boys from the girls, the one thing that, that makes everybody come to that decision and that fork in the road where you got to make a decision. Either I'm going to follow God, I'm going to have faith, I'm going to believe the Bible, and I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to fulfill the role that God has called me to fulfill, or I'm not. See, this preaching leaves you without the opportunity to live in the the middle. You don't get to live in any gray area. There is no gray area. As a man, you lead your home and you provide. I've had so many people tell me, One guy said, what am I supposed to do? Work 12 hours a day? Yes. Or complain about how many hours they work and and that, you know, they need money for this. And their wife needs to worry about that or be concerned with that. No, your wife doesn't need to be concerned with that. That's your job to be concerned with, not hers. She shouldn't wonder where that money's coming from. She should, by faith, be praying with you. And if it's not there, it's not there. That's fine. But you know what? She doesn't need to worry about that and wonder where that's coming from. Why? Because it's not her. That's not her duty. Nowhere in the Bible will you see that's her duty to do that. Nowhere. And I'll tell you what it does. It pushes feminism. That's what it does. It pushes another spirit. I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've I've watched it. I've watched the brassiness that comes. I've watched the disregard for God's word when it comes. I've watched the the sacrifice of biblical principles on the altar of making more money and everything else and it is not worth it. You want to give a woman an attitude? Send her to work.
be honest with you. You want to give a woman an attitude and give her an independent streak, then tell her you're not going to provide for her and she can go do it. You'll give her an attitude. And then when you tell her she needs to be submissive and do this and do this and do this and do that, you're gonna, you, she's going to be like, well, I mean, yeah, but you send me to work to go do this. She won't say that to you. I will. The first thing I'll ask you is if you're having those marital problems or anything like that, I'm going to ask you, okay, are you sending your wife off to make money for you? If you tell me yes, I'm going to say, well, fix that first. Because ain't nothing else going to get fixed until that's fixed. Because you've got to follow God's word. You have to follow God's word. You have to obey him. You have to be submissive to God first. But how am I going to make it? It's called faith. Yeah, it's called faith. And it's called hard work. And it's called motivation. It's called direction. It's called, you know, it's called being a man. <laughs> right? And you know what? I'm not coming down on people because I know most people have never heard this before. But this is the absolute plain gospel truth. And I've seen the attitude that comes when you place your wife in subjection to another man. I remember Curtis Hudson telling a story one time, and he was like acting like it, he was like this great man because he did this. But his uh, his secretary and her husband, I already have a problem with that right there. His secretary and her husband were at dinner with him and his wife. And the secretary went and got Curtis Hudson's coffee. And he said, and here's what he said. He said, oh, no, don't you do that. You serve your own husband. You don't, you don't serve me. And he thought that was virtuous. And what I say to you is she shouldn't even been working with him anyway. That's, that's really old-fashioned, isn't it, preacher? Are you sure you're not stuck? stuck? Yeah, I'm stuck back here. I'm in here. You know where we're supposed to be? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember that, right? If you go to Numbers 30, I'm going to read these verses. I'm not going to expound on them, but I am going to talk about them. If, if you got to go, well, sit tight. You ain't got nothing better to do anyway today. You really don't. I'm not going to expound on all of them, but I'm almost done. But I want to read these to you because I think they're important. It says in verse number two, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Right? If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul and her father shall hold his peace in her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. Did you know that a daughter under your roof is not allowed to go make promises to people and go do everything like that? She's supposed to be under your roof. You're supposed to be leading her. Number five, but if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. And if she had at all a husband when she vowed, or uttered aught out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her in the day that she heard it, he heard it, then her vows shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. The husband, it's his responsibility. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow what she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. Wait, why is it, what's this, what's going on with this uh, male chauvinist pig stuff right here? What's going on here with this? I mean, the husband's making the decisions and he can disavow stuff and the woman's not allowed to make that vow like that and, and he's able to disannul it. 
What's going on with that? I mean, it's almost like God's trying to show you a difference in the order of the sexes. I mean, if, if I didn't know any better, I would think these are instructions. And principles that never change, by the way, because if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, same principles are there on a man giving away his daughter. Okay, but if every if every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced wherewith she hath bound her their soul shall stand against her, and if she vowed in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her and disallowed her not, that all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard it, then then whatsoever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict his soul, the soul her husband may establish or her husband may make void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he established all her vows and all her bond, which are upon her. He confirmeth them because he held his peace at her in the day he heard them. But if he shall in any ways make them void after that he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. Okay, so those same principles you'll find as the, the husband being the head of the, of the wife. You'll find those in Ephesians chapter 6. You'll also find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that talks about giving the daughter away. It also says that if a, if a man, it says also in the Old Testament that if a man lie with somebody's daughter, that fornication doesn't make them married. That man could say, no, you defrauded my daughter, you owe me money, and you will pay me for defrauding my daughter, and you will not get my daughter's hand in marriage. That's why if they elope and the father doesn't agree to that, technically it's not. He stole her. But the father shouldn't be allowing her to run around like that. Amen. Now, we realize there are situations where this is not being followed, and this is not, and you have to do the best you can with those situations. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So it's, it's up to you whether you are going to obey it or not. But that's what the Bible says. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we can look at the Word of God and see the truth in it. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us now to receive these truths and, Lord, to fight that awful, wicked feminism, Lord, and the fruit of it as we see it in our day. Help us to defend our, our, the truth. Help us to stand for it. Help our lives to show the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.